director of the local history center there and author, one of whose books I draw your attention to, delightful title, well, at least the subtext, uh, popular violence in the English Revolution, uh, underlined the Colchester Plunderers. Sounds like a great pop group too. But uh, we're delighted to have uh, John. He's not just all of these things. He's a very good friend of the Historical Association. Today's talk is uh, the historian's puzzle and the family historian's dream. This is the Essex Great Petition of 1642. And there couldn't be a more interesting echo that arrived in the post today. Here's a link for you. <laughs> I got my census information. If you can spot the link as we go. And John, I'd be obliged if you can stick a reference in occasionally to a woman because it's the day of women and it's Women's History Month with the HA. Anyway, no pressure there. Thank you very much. Okay, well, th thank you very much, Ian. And thank you very much to the members for inviting me and uh, a wave to all of those uh, names that uh, seemed uh, familiar and, and some of those faces that I, I uh, well remember. I'm going to try and share my screen and hopefully if I've got things working as I want them to work, and of course I haven't, you just have to bear with me for a moment while I try and get myself uh, somehow organised again. Okay, I'll have to do it. I'll have to do it in a minute, but I'm going to try to share my screen if I could. Which is not. Okay. Um, right. So I, I'm putting this up for two reasons. One is to replace uh, the missing question mark, uh, which I failed to give you in my title. So it asks if this is the historian's puzzle, and if indeed it is the family historian's uh, dream, and uh, we, will, we will see as we, as we uh, go on. I'm gonna try and do, foolishly, uh, five things uh, today uh, for you. I'm gonna try and start very briefly by saying why counties matter when we try to understand what I call the English Revolution, but other people will call the English Civil War. And then I'm going to go on to look in particular at these two Essex petitions, which were sent to Parliament from the county in 1642. And I'm going to begin by looking at the politics of that. What were these petitions about? What, what were they trying to achieve? And then going to go on to thinking about what it meant to actually be able to produce a petition in the circumstances of the middle of the 17th century. I spent today getting this talk ready with my computer, with broadband, with my mobile phone, with my scanner. And I hope you keep in mind uh, that this uh, is a petition from the county uh, without any of those uh, neat devices. How was it possible to perform petitioning? How could people arrive at a, a context in which they could actually present thousands of signatures on a petition to parliament? And then I'm going to go on to show you the petition and to think a little bit about, uh, is it a puzzle? It certainly is for me. And is it a dream for us uh, as family historians? And then finally and briefly, I'm going to uh, try and convince you as to why my obsession matters. Back in 1992, um, I first encountered uh, these petitions, which are held in the parliamentary archives. And since then, off and on, I've been trying to make sense of them. Make sense of them because somebody had the clever idea that in order to present a petition to Parliament, 
it had to take the form of a role and that what they uh, proceeded to do was to cut up all the petitions from the individual Essex towns and villages, helpfully, unhelpfully, removing most of the names of those villages and towns, and then to glue them on a continuous piece of parchment so that they could conform to the protocol of issuing a petition. And since 1992, uh, mostly on my own, but sometimes with the help of uh, uh, one of my research students, and again with interested colleagues, I've been trying to solve the puzzle, to reconstitute the petition in, in a way that would allow us uh, to use it, either as historians, as local historians, or indeed uh, for family historians. Uh, there are two petitions, one to the House of Commons, one to the House of Lords. The House of Lords has a thousand just two signatures short of a thousand signatures. And in the House of Commons, impossible to count for reasons I'll get back to, there are some thousands uh, of, of, um, of names. Let's begin then with that first theme about why counties matter when we try to understand the uh, English uh, Civil War, the English Revolution. Well, beginning at sort of shortly after the middle of the 20th century, historians went back to the counties to try and understand the politics of England in relation to the counties. And for a long time, the dominant view was that politics in the counties, in as much as it could be said to be politics, was about provincialism, about localism, and in the context of the Civil War, often neutralism. And it's only gradually as the 20th century uh, uh, ran itself out and into the 21st century that there's been a radical shift in how historians now think about politics in the provinces and provinces beyond Westminster. And for a whole variety of reasons, which I, I won't go into here, there is now an argument that the counties matter because it was in the counties and in their local communities that ordinary men and women experienced the politics of the 17th century. In that earlier interest in counties, historians were only really interested in the gentry and above with the elite. So the change that's taken place has been to try to restore a sense of the politics uh, of, of the people. And, and I tried to play my part in that. Uh, let's go on then to try and look more specifically at the early 1640s from when these petitions come. And secondly, that second theme I was going to say, to talk about context. Very, very briefly, between 1629 and 1640, Charles I had tried to govern without Parliament, but he was forced by rebellion in Scotland, uh, eventually to recall Parliament, and Parliament became the focus almost immediately of very active petitioning campaigns from individual communities, from individuals who felt that they were victims of Charles's personal rule, and increasingly uh, from larger uh, conglomerations, uh, one of which was the most important perhaps, were counties. And by 1642, there had been a breakdown of trust between Charles and Parliament, and petitioning therefore becomes an attempt to address the stalemate that existed. Parliament was beginning to have to take measures which you could no longer describe as restoring traditional rule, but it was beginning to have to think about taking measures that the king could point out were radical, new, and as the king would argue, responsible for troubles in the church and, and in the state. And in early 1642, there is what's called, uh, what we could call a wave of petitions sent in from the counties uh, to uh, parliament. Now, many of these uh, survive uh, in the parliamentary archives and many more survive in print 
it's one of the major changes taking place in the early 1640s is the sheer explosion of print and in particular of cheap print. And one aspect of that was the printing of petitions. Now that in itself was innovative and in some people would say radical. Petitions in the past had been things that were presented in person, in manuscript, which were presented with particular protocols. It's quite significant that when people write their petitions, they talk about kneeling to present them. And they were meant to be advisory, not coercive. That is, you are literally supplicants to the king or to somebody in superior authority to listen to your grievances and you hoped perhaps take actions to resolve them. Now the 1640s sees a radical break with that understanding of the petition. Petitions are no longer being organized by elites. They're being organized by, uh, the, as mass petitions. They are increasingly employing a language that we would recognize, not just of stating grievances, but stating what the petitioners would hope uh, would be the, the, the recipient, in this case, the king or parliament, what measures they should take in order to deal with the, the, the kingdom's ills. Now that gives rise to an interesting debate amongst historians about whether these petitions can be taken to be representative of popular politics, of popular political opinion, or whether they are what some historians would call parrot petitions. That is, they're simply parroting back to Parliament what itself wanted the people to say to them. And there's a continuing debate, and it, you probably won't take you long to realise uh, where I position myself uh, in, in that debate. So here, here we've got two petitions uh, from Essex, in fact, three, as we'll see in a moment, which are presented to Parliament in January 1642. Uh, 40, and here's how most historians, most of us, encounter these petitions. By a process about which we would like to know much, much more, they were printed and uh, sold. Now that in itself is again another, another radical departure. And if you look at this petition towards the bottom, you'll see that it claims to be published by order to prevent false copies, but it doesn't actually stipulate uh, what the authority is by which uh, this is being, being, being printed. So there's a kind of uneasiness about the resort to print. And what, if we read the title, it says these are three petitions, the one of the inhabitants of the town of Colchester, about which more a little later on, and the other two of the county of Essex. But I want to just draw your attention to the, the last bit here in the smaller print, which says these petitions were brought by many thousands of the county of Essex and was accepted, were accepted, the 20th of January into both houses of parliament. So in January 1642, Essex petitions presents one petition to the House of Commons, and it presents one petition uh, to the House of Lords. And this contemporary woodcut, I think something of a something of a sort of um, well, it has its problems, tells us that the counties were coming to London uh, to petition Parliament and they're carrying on their staves on horseback, you can see these little papers waving, they're carrying, uh, carrying something called a copy of a protestation about which I've written a book and I could spend too long talking about. But it says the counties of Essex, Hertford, Berkshire, Surrey, followed therein in like manner. So again, what's interesting is we've got mass petitioning because these petitions are being circulated and signed in the counties, and they're being presented uh, as here um, uh, by uh, men 
on horseback and we'll, we'll come back and think about what the significance of, of horse ownership might be. Now, if we go back to the parliamentary archives and we look at the actual documents themselves, we'll begin to see that they're rather different in some ways from the uh, petition as printed. This one comes from the county and it says at the top, although you may find it hard to read, uh, it's presented to the Honourable House of Peers. And essentially it makes a series of statements and then it makes a series of requests. And those uh, statements are addressing the crisis of early 1642, in which they don't believe the king can be trusted, in which there's a rebellion broken out in Ireland and they worry that the king might be uh, trying to bring an army from Ireland into England and that army would, have to, uh, would be Catholic. And so it talks about the, the fears of the Tower of London. They don't trust uh, the person the king's put in as lieutenant. They complain that their arms have been stripped out of the county in order to fight the rebellion in Scotland. They complain that gentlemen that they trust have been kicked off the Commission of Peace. That is, they're no longer magistrates in the county. They worry about the presence of what they call prelates, that is bishops and popish lords in the House of Lords. And they uh, express annoyance that there are Catholic priests illegally in this country condemned by law who Charles has failed to put to execution. And it carries with it a little sting in the tail, which I don't think you'll be able to, to read and if you could see this pointer. But it says at the end that the county is suffering in its two main sources of, of, in its economy, in terms of the cloth industry, a major employer in the north and centre of the county, and in terms of farming. And it ends with a very interesting phrase, and it says, whereof the multitudes of our people have lived, and the danger of unemployment, that we tremble to think what may follow thereupon. And what they want to achieve by this is they want to make the House of Lords tremble. So this is some way from the conventional protocols of petitioning. Uh, and that's, 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 the, that's the one uh, from the House, House of Lords. And it's then followed up in a series of uh, signatures which is, I've counted, and which are, which are too short of a thousand. Here's the petition, the same, same, essentially the same petition, and this is the petition to the House of Commons. And again, it, it makes the same sort of observations about the dangers and problems uh, in the uh, country, and it, it again uh, asks for those grievances to be remedied. But there are subtle differences between this and the House of Lords petition. This one is much more strident about the failure of reformation. They think that Parliament's attempt to reform the church, which they would like to be in a more godly Puritan direction, is actually being stifled, being stymied by the fact that there are still in the House of Lords Popish lords, Catholic lords, and the bishops. So this has a more radical edge to it. And then you can see that underneath, not unlike, not unlike the, the petition uh, to the House of Lords, that there are a series of signatures. So two petitions. We don't know whether that from Colchester was presented. We don't know whether the Colchester position was folded uh, in, into, into, these, um, into these two petitions. And if everything was like this, both historians and family historians would be very happy. So the, leaving aside the small area that's green here, this is deep in the body 
of the petition to the House of Commons. And very helpfully, Stephen Marshall has written his name at the top of this petition and we're able to identify it as Finching Field. Interestingly, in this little purple dot to the bottom, a contemporary hand had counted the number of names. And so we're able to get a snapshot of Essex uh, in uh, of Finchinfield in 1642. Stephen Marshall was one of the leading Puritan ministers in England in the early modern period. He was important in linking the county to Parliament. He was an important figure who was very often to be found preaching in this period outside his parish, both to Parliament itself, but, but also in many of the surrounding towns and villages. He's a key player, we might say, in the politics of 1642. Now, if everything was like that, many years ago, I would have finished my research and I would happily, happily have gone on to do something different. But over here, highlighted under this green rule, we have a long list of names, many of them signatures, and no idea uh, that um, without beginning to do some homework. But if we look at the top here, we can see that the first name and thinking about Stephen Marshall in Finchingfield is in fact a minister. And so we can identify uh, that parish. So it would have been a dream if really most of the petitions weren't like this. So if you look at this sheet and if you look carefully, you can see that somebody has glued this area here, has glued a list of names, no identification, onto this top sheet of, of paper. <clears throat> and that somebody has then glued that sheet of paper over a bottom sheet of paper with a whole series whole series of other names. So the desire to conform to protocol meant that they created for us a giant sort of giant puzzle. It's worth comparing that with the one to the House of Lords. Now, this one is consistently neater in the way that this sheet shows you. Names take the form of continuous columns, and the implication is that these are people who have uh, signed up and signed their names. And we might be encouraged to think that because over here, highlighted, we have two people who have actually gone on to show us, to, to describe themselves, of particular places so that we might think of this as being a statement of the county. But the reality again, as, as we'll discover, is that the House of Lords was also, uh, was also a sort of put, put together a composite, composite sort of um, composite uh, column. So the reality is that we have potentially something enormously valuable we have something that would give us thousands of names that would ground those names in particular places and we might might be able to do all sorts of interesting things with them and i spent a, a good deal of good deal of time over the years trying to uh, replace to identify particular places and there are various procedures which i follow to try to make this possible. But they're extremely laborious and very time consuming. And you'll want to know how many parishes since 1992, working off and on on that petition, I've been able to identify. And there's the rather stark news that I've managed to identify with confidence 80 out of the about 405 Essex uh, parishes. 
That is by seeing if the leading names are those of the local minister or gentleman, by comparing the names with various other valuable listings for Essex, the 1630 ship money uh, assessment, which exists for almost the whole of the county, or the 1670 hearth tax, uh, which, which I'm sure uh, many of you will be familiar with, which were published very helpfully by Christopher Thornton and, and, and colleagues. Um, I tried to, to do it by looking at unusual names. One of the uh, challenges as you go along is that you hit a name like Silence Maltwood. And you think, great, you know, that's going to be a name that's going to turn up in SEAX on the, on the Essex Record Office's excellent website. And you go to the, the website to discover that Silence Maltwood is silent. That is, that for people who are relatively humble, that their chances of appearing in, a, in the county uh, lists for, on SEAX are limited, unless they're criminals, perhaps if they're officials, but property is one of the major drivers of the names that, 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 that kind of exist on, on um, CX. Repentance Bingley, littered through the text, so one or two, uh, one or two names with repentance applied to them, which seems to have been the convention in Essex uh, for uh, naming children who were born out of wedlock, who were, bo who were born uh, to, to elicit non-married uh, couples. But again, the repentances are not to, be, not to be found. So it's a long and laborious process to try to do that. Now, I, I want to move on now to try and think about a little bit more about how these petitions were performed. And if you look at this map, it does tell you something really rather important, which is that petitioning seems to have been a county-wide procedure in early 1642. It doesn't tell you that all parishes and all towns were in fact uh, participating in this in this petitioning, and that's a, an important driver for trying to go on to identify more, more, more of the, the parishes than, than I, in my part-time way I've been able to do so. But it says that this was a, uh, a, 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 um, a county-wide phenomenon. Now, when you look at the jigsaw puzzle that is the, there are these petitions, there are certain things that, that, that jump out at you, which say a lot about the nature of 17th century society, and in particular of Essex society. We're talking here about petitions in which it was male married householders who signed the petition and who were, if anything, representative of uh, their families. Still interesting because many of those people whose names are recorded are not capable of signing their names. They're people who we must assume came from the dark village who were part of the poor, part of those who, who had not learned, may, may have been able to read, but hadn't been able to write. There are one or two, Ian asked me to talk about women and I, I'm uh, happy to do so. There are one or two widows uh, to be found, but they are very few in number. And perhaps interestingly, they come from the Puritan clothing uh, townships. But again, looking at the little, the little glimmers that you get between these stuck on names, you get a, a quite striking sense of how this petition was organized. It was organized locally. It was taken in the church. It, the names were originally attached to a copy of the petition. And it looks by a slight reference to uh, the first or the second petition that people might have been invited to uh, also sign 
the petition to the House of Lords, although noticed only a thousand people, as opposed to many thousands, signed the House of Lords uh, petition. Uh, interesting work has been done for Earls Cone, uh, an Essex parish which you may or may not be aware of has had thousands of research council, thousands of pounds worth of research council money poured into it. And it's possible to look at the names and the ordering of the names once identified on the petition and to see that they literally offer a, offer a map of where people sat in the parish church with the wealthy, long established families in both the North and South Isle appearing at the top of the petition and those who were marginal and poor uh, falling towards the bottom uh, of the petition. A stray date can be found and that suggests quite interestingly that this petition was taken in January but if you remember the original printed version it was presented to Parliament on the 20th of January. So in, in this world without mobile phones, without broadband online access, not only was it possible to organize a countywide petitioning campaign, but it was possible to organize it, to collect uh, those local petitions, to have them presented as a role and to have them presented to parliament. So who's doing this? Who, who are the people who are kind of key players? And I think we've got some clues to that, which we can again, if we just return to look at these. If you can look at the bottom of the petition to the House of Lords, for those of you who know, know 17th century Essex or know about Essex families, quite a lot of these names leap out at us as leading county magistrates. But they are magistrates who are, are going to be uh, noticeable for their support of godly reformation and for sort of and for support of parliament against the king there are some striking absences uh, from these names now that might be what we might expect but if we were to to do this and, and uh, graham hart who is himself working on petitions a former uh, doctoral student dr hart has compared the signatures on this uh, opening page of the House of Lords with the opening page of the House of Commons. And something very intriguing turns up, which is there are people on, those opening on that opening page. This is the most significant place to, to find your name, who are not county magistrates, who would not generally be known to us, but turn out to be tenants of the Earl of Warwick. Uh, now, I know that Christopher Thompson is sitting amongst us and he is the, the historian on, on uh, the Earl of Warwick and has been very helpful uh, to me in suggesting that this was not just a pro-Parliament, a pro-Puritan -Ref Reformation petition, but it may well have been a petition which is being organized by the Earl of Warwick and uh, his allies, his officers, and his tenants. And although there's more work to be done on that, and perhaps also to be related to the map I showed you, that, that's very suggestive, I think, of the politics behind the petition. This is a sort of godly Puritan pro-parliament petition com coming out from, from, from the county and doubtless with some coordination with, um, with, with uh, Essex's representatives uh, in Parliament. So something that was organised centrally by some active agents, taken down into the parish, and then people inv were invited uh, to sign or mark their names, presumably having had the petition read to them, possibly from the pulpit, uh, before they in fact sign. Although one of the complaints made in other counties is that people are required to sign something. They've actually <laughs> no idea what they're, what they're signing. And when you go to a granular level in the petition, certain names start to jump out at you. And one of my uh, favorites 
in, in all this um, is uh, a man in the Earl's Cone list called Thomas Harvey. And Thomas Harvey, who was a very poor weaver, is nonetheless shown to be there signing uh, this January petition. And I've written about Thomas Harvey because Thomas Harvey is a man who listens to Ralph Jocelyn's preaching, who takes the petition in support of Parliament against the threat from what Parliament describes as popery from Catholicism, and who then feels emboldened to go into the church between services on a Sunday and to take away the prayer book, which he thinks is still unreformed and full of Catholic, uh, Catholic ideas and to try and burn it and to swim it. So what the document can start to show us is that it told people that they mattered. Petitions, in the, uh, petitions before 1640s were presented in the name of counties, but presented by their elites. And as the care with which this petition is collected and then presented, weight of numbers matters. And that's why I showed you on the Finching Field that a contemporary had gone through, and if you look down here, had then counted all the numbers for each, for each parish has counted the numbers so that they, they can in fact, again, reinforce this message, which is this is a kind of collective statement of uh, the, the, the kind of the, the interests of, of the county. So we can see in the act of performing a petition, the way in which it can politicize people who live their lives below, below the level of the, the gentry, below, below, the, below uh, the level of, of, of local elites. And we can begin to think about how that helps to explain events that are going on in the county while people feel like Thomas Harvey, that they themselves can take responsibility for reforming their parish church for popular iconoclasm uh, and, a, and a series of other measures they, un, they, they undertake. Now, I've spent some time trying to do this and, and I, no longer am I responsible for teaching and hooray, I'm no longer responsible for sitting on committees in my university, and I'm now able to do more work on this. And what I've been able to do with the, with the help of the parliamentary, um, parliamentary archive is to generate copies of the petition and to, to really take it to pieces. So I've now got very sorts of interesting, uh, large, long, large copies of strips of names which can then be put together again, not least by handwriting, where the local minister or somebody else has been responsible for producing a uniform list of names, it's possible to start to, 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 to um, reconstitute the petition and to move towards, towards identifying them. Now, these petitions were only the start for Essex in the English Civil War and the English Revolution. They were succeeded by a whole series of petitions. By the end of 1642, it was the Royalists who were trying to organize the petition, which called upon Parliament for accommodation, which in, it, in itself was a sort of, was a sort of you know, an attempt to, to persuade people uh, that they should support the King in bringing pressure to bear on Parliament. England is now in a fighting a civil war in order to come to a settlement with the King. And successive changes in the politics of the nation also continue to produce petitions right up to and including the restoration of monarchy uh, with Charles II. Now, in trying to think about the significance of all this, we need to go back to where we started. Historians used to think that counties were distinguished by their provincialism, by their localism, and although I think this doesn't work very well, by their neutralism. 
that early work assumed that politics was the preserve of the gentry. It was the preserve perhaps of those who were wealthy and educated, the, mid the middling sort of farmers, but it consigned the rest of, of, of British English society to a, a, a state of sort of political um, apathy. Now, what becomes critical, therefore, is whether these are parrot petitions sent out from the, from the centre in order to be signed by the counties, or whether they are, in fact, petitions which give people an opportunity to think about the politics of the period and to express something of their own ideas. And I'm pretty clear uh, that performing petitioning, having it in church, read out by the local minister, being invited to sign your name, is itself an act of political mobilization. And therefore, it's important that we try to identify as many of the parishes as we can that still remain to be identified to see how far this was representative of the county or how far those who were deeply hostile to what Parliament was trying to do were able to prevent that petitioning process from taking place in their parish. And as I suggested, there are already some interesting absences, perhaps. Maybe they're hidden in the yet to be identified parishes, but perhaps they simply were prevented from participating. Now, finally, what's the significance of, of this? What, why bother? And I think it's important because it tells us that the English Civil War was not just a battle of armies, but it also gives us a clue as to why it became a battle of ideas. A whole series of changes which have been taking place perhaps for a century before uh, the outbreak of civil war, some of which we, 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 we wouldn't have to think very hard about. Um, the growth of education up to and including the universities, um, the diffusion of wealth, uh, the increase in, in printing, and most strikingly, the growing participation in government. The fact that many people in the counties, in their local parish, were necessarily active in ensuring the, the good administration of the realm. All of those things help to explain why it was that the English Civil War should become a battle of ideas. And these two petitions uh, are sort of a window onto the way in which a county like Essex could find itself becoming politicized by these developments. Thank you. <clears throat> Excellent, John. Excellent. You have given us what we love in the National HA and in local branches, the meeting of a practicing, researching historian with us who are interested uh, locally. Fantastic. Andy, can you take over and uh, yes. organize our questioning, please? Yes. Um, so far, two people have said something in chat. Well, the first one is really more of a statement from Christopher Thompson, is it? Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm happy to recognise that it was presented, uh, but I'm uh, pretty much sure that Colchester's names are included in the petition from the county, which is itself something very interesting. There's a question from Ruth Hearn. This is fascinating. I'd like to use this as a source in the classroom. Where can I find a summary of the complaints within the petition? Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the, the, there is a, an excellent book for teaching purposes uh, by a man called Anthony Fletcher, 
Um, and, I, and my mind has suddenly gone blank, but somebody will tell me. And if I can strike my shelf for a moment. <coughs> There's a book by Anthony Fletcher called The Outbreak of the English Civil War. And it's written by a very distinguished historian who had uh, in, in the 1970s begun a project to collect all the petitions and to have them published in a series of, of, of volumes. And very sadly, uh, the uh, finances of the publishing house uh, collapsed and it, it never happened. But as a result, he wrote that book, The Outbreak of the English Civil War. And there are two very good chapters which would give you uh, details of the of the um, of, of the nature of the petitionings. If I can somehow uh, share my screen again for a moment, uh, if you bear with me. Um, and sat, sat at the bottom here is is um, is my is my email address, and I would be very happy uh, if Ruth were to write to me. Uh, I I will I will make it possible for her to have copies uh, of of the petitions. Um, they're very concise, and you'll very quickly be able to see uh, what the, what the the grievances are. Okay, thank you. There's a. Um... There's a question from Graham Hart. Was the petition signed at the end of the morning service? And can we find any parishes where we know the leading gentry family were royalists? Um, hello, Graham. Um, the answer to the first is, we don't know. Um, we would uh, very much like to know, uh, as I suggested, the Earl's Cone study, which was done by, by a really interesting book by uh, an Australian historian, uh, suggests that the, the church was the place within which the signing took place. And I think that's very logical. Um, but we, we, just, we, we don't I, know. I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I would say- John, that- um, January is um, not a very inviting month to be hanging around in the church for very long. No. And um, you do want to get as many hands as possible. So yeah. it's, it's probably no good saying, come on Wednesday evening. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure it is. I'm just being, you know, over, overly hmm. careful um, at the moment because I'm aware that I haven't shown you the most difficult places to identify are the very large towns or townships. And um, there are some lists of continu continuous lists of same, same, uh, same parish or same hand where uniform hand is taken. Um, and as we know with the protestation, another document from this period, that in very large London parishes, uh, some people signed on the Sunday, but then they were told they can come back to the vestry on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, mm -hmm. and they can continue to continue to continue to sign. Um, and and the second question is, I would love to know: uh, Are there parishes where the gentry are royalists and which don't sign? Uh, Cressing Temple, where Henry Neville mm -hmm. was, you know, the, the, the squire is an obvious example uh, of this. I, I've yet to find any evidence, but, but it may still lie hidden within that. And there are other places mm -hmm. where we know there to be a gentry who are more likely to support the, the king. And that, that's why, as you know, Graham, because you've done your own work on the Cambridgeshire petitions, it does make it important that I get on <laughs> with this and try to identify as many of the parishes as, as I can. Thanks. Sorry. It's a question from Sue saying, I'm a trustee at Rayleigh Town Museum. Is there any mention of Rayleigh? Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, I, mean, I could hold it up to you, but you're not going to be able to see it. 
but for Rayleigh, uh, we have uh, 117 names, uh, some of which are signatures and some of which are marks. And since the contemporary hand, if you remember, each parish has a count, we know that we've got the whole of the parish of Rayleigh, or that is all the adult males who were present and able to sign, uh, signed that. For Rayleigh, additionally, and very, very excitingly, we, we also have the protestation. Um, the, I should say the protestation is a document produced by parliament when it fears that the king in the, in the early summer of 1641 is likely to invade parliament and by force suppress parliament. It produces a, 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 a document called the protestation, which is, it requires people to take, to swear to, starts by saying, I, John Walter in the presence of God. So this is an extremely, for, the, for 17th century political culture to be required to take an oath. And again, if you were, you were poor to be invited to take an oath, quite excitingly, I found when I wrote the book that many women also uh, signed this. And in some parishes we know, because the minister complains, the women said they want to sign it. And, you know, they're effectively apologizing. I'm sorry, I'm sending you women's names. And we know more interestingly, <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> and the, more interestingly, we know that the protestation was signed not just by adult married males, but it was also signed by all males who are over the age of 18, an extremely significant date for Parliament, to, uh, date, uh, age date for Parliament to choose because that was the traditional uh, age for military recruitment and mobilization. And there's some argument that the protestation might have been the basis for military resistance against Charles I. Now, if we go back to Rayleigh, it's a long diversion. Only 60 people signed the protestation in Rayleigh compared to 117 who sign or mark the petition. And there's a very intriguing question. What's going on there? Have people seen the protestation as a more radical document? Are people now less willing to sign something? Uh, it, it's one thing to sign a petition. It's another thing to be invited personally to take an oath before God uh, about, about defending parliament. So um, again, if you were to, um, uh, is it Sue? If, if Sue were to email me, I can probably uh, take a photograph <laughs> of the Rayleigh return and and I can let you, I can let you see it but obviously it, it it actually is copyright to the parliamentary archive and if you wanted to do anything with it then you would need to 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 write to them and 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 to get their permission I should say that the parliamentary archive itself has been running a project on parliament and the people and it's identified petitions to parliament as being a particularly a particular interest to them and so they would likely to be I think sympathetic to a local community writing in to say you know could we actually um, perhaps you know exhibit uh, the names on that. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Anne Grimshaw. You made a reference early on to horse owning and its significance. Could you enlarge upon this please? Yeah thank you. Um, I started by saying that there were protocols of about petitioning before 16, the 1640s. And the assumption there was that if petitions were presented, that they'd be presented by representatives, that is by the MPs or by the leading aristocratic figure or the leading gentry families in, in the county. And what that would cut showed you if I can go back to the this this slightly romanticized wood woodcut um, what it shows you is this is what was happening that people were riding from their counties uh, to uh, parliament in order to present 
uh, their, their petition. And the significance of horse ownership, apart from the fact if you're going to go from Essex to, to Westminster, then, you know, far better to be doing it on a horse, um, it is that that suggested some degree of wealth and social status. So this looks like if it was happening, then it was happening amongst those who were perhaps of the gentry, but below the gentry, who were prosperous merchants, prosperous farmers, pe people who were able to keep and an, an feed and feed a horse. So it gives some clue uh, to, to, to um, the sort of process of presenting a petition. But none of these people, none of those people are kneeling, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> Thank There's you. A question from Peter Evans. Have the Free Burgess family names, e.g., Colchester, been of help? Uh, please, please say that again. Sorry, I missed it and I'm just struggling with my screen at the moment. It's from Peter Evans. Have the Free Burgess family names, e.g., Colchester, been of help? Uh, the Burgess names, you mean members of the corporation? I think I don't know if Peter Evans could explain further. Yeah. Okay. No, I can see. I can see it. Thank you. Um, so, so in, in this piece of detective work, there are certain things standard for the county. That's the first place that we'd want to go and look. And um, uh, because. Going back to Graham Hart's question, we think they were most likely to be taken in church. And because we know from Stephen Marshall that the practice was for the minister to sign their name first, then there is sitting in, there's a man called Harold Smith, who if you don't know him, is a hero of mine, who produced a book called The Clergy of Essex uh, under the Long Parliament, um, who, was, it, was himself a clergyman in Essex and did masses and masses and masses of work. And both his, both his book, uh, which you used to be able to get copies fairly easily uh, in the county, and more importantly, sitting in the Essex Record Office, his edition of New Court's list of clergymen for Essex. Uh, he produced a typescript, two volumes of typescript, you can start by, if you're talking about identifying from names, then you're obviously trying to go and look for the, the clergy. Uh, as Graham Hart, who asked a question earlier, would know, it's very annoying that some clergymen have curates and curates are usually anonymous and they often do the job that the minister should be doing. And it's very hard to find many of these lists, which are clearly the start of a list of a particular place with a name prominently, it's incredibly hard if they're a curate to be able to identify that name. Uh, there is for, for the county ship money uh, in the 1630s, again, extraordinary list of names that sit in the National Archive, which were transcribed, a copy of the transcription is in the Essex Record Office. And uh, uh, there was also little card indexes by individual names. If anybody wants a project, it would be extraordinary to actually put those online in type so that they could be easily consulted. And then you go to particular places and that's where we get back to free burgesses. So I spent quite a lot of my life working on the history of early modern 17th century Colchester. And if you go to urban records, then you can start to find those, those kind of lists. Uh, the trouble is that there are only a certain number of first Christian names that people thought to use in the 17th century. So if you're called John, as I am, and now a very rare name among students I teach, um, then, you know, the problem is there are too many Johns. And if you're Thomas, even worse. I mean, I mean, one interesting sidelight getting ready to give this talk was, I've seen almost no Charles. I'm really interested by this. Quite a number of Jameses, but no Charles. And obviously Charles is not an apostolic name he's not part of the apostles so you can get names like names of the free burgesses but you know you're going to need something else in order to take that particular whatever it might be thomas smith and to be able to see whether that thomas smith is thomas smith of colchester 
or one of the other 35 Thomas Smiths mm -hmm. who can be found in every other bit, bit of Essex. So very grateful for lists like that, uh, but of themselves, they, 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 don't, they don't do the job. And what you're often doing when I'm doing this, now I've got these little jigs of these little reconstituted cut up parishes is just working through the names. And as those of you who are family historians and those of you who know the period will know that neo-local movement was extremely common. People might be born in one place, might hold land in one place, but uh, might have a life cycle that takes them around. So it, it, it was a, a job and a half to distinguish Romford from Hornchurch, for example, because many, many people in the course of their life can be found in these identifiers in both of those places at different points in their life. But yeah, and Colchester is my big aim. I, I, I mean, I do think that Colchester is embedded in this uh, and, you know, watch this space, but, but, but not in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. um, from Richard Jones, have you been able to identify Little Baddo as a parish on the petition as the protestation for Little Baddo exists as well too? Well, I think I've got good news for you, I believe, but I better just, better just check and, hmm. No, I don't have good news for you. Um, somebody earlier asked me about if, if I'd like a copy of the of the Little Baddo uh, presentation. Is that is that the same? Is that Chris? Is that yours? Is it some somebody else? Before uh, it's, no, it's Richard. Um, uh, I haven't been able to identify it. I think I might. I've, I've got another list of possibles. So as I start to build up some hits then I move, move things from just this, you know, unidentified mass into, into a, a separate folders. And uh, I, I did at some point transcribe the protestation returns for, for Essex, but I, if you have a copy, I would really like, like to see it. Uh, you may not know, but uh, partly as a result of my book, um, two things happen. One is that the parliamentary archives have now put online for every Essex parish for which there is a protestation return in the archive as opposed to in the parish register. Uh, they have put them online as, as a facsimile document. And as a result of that, a group of historians in Cambridge are now working to produce, um, to produce a kind of national uh, listing in which every protestation return uh, should be available to us in modern transcription. And when I wrote my book and, and received Research Council funding for it, uh, I argued that in fact, the protestation should be thought of perhaps as Britain's first census. It's incomplete. Uh, we don't have it surviving for all counties, but nonetheless, I think I calculated there are some million, several million names caught up in the protestation return all of whom have a date and place assigned to them. And I'm looking forward uh, to when those historians are, are going to, going to uh, produce this work. A man called uh, Cliff, Clifford Webb, some of you might know him, he's been a very distinguished figure in, in um, uh, transcribing many things uh, it, that are to be found in the National Archive for this, for this period, is, is one of the key researchers working on that. Um, but if I get little bad -o, uh, you know, I, 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 and, and you send me your copy of the protestation return. We will have a we'll have a relationship, and I'll let you know. <clears throat> Thank you. The next question was: I wonder how Ingate Stone signed, considering the influence of the Petri family. Yeah, Is yeah. That... Well, I, 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 um, I'd like to know. Uh, we, 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 at the moment, I, I haven't identified many uh, parishes where the local leading family were themselves Catholic. That's not to say that the parish mightn't have, have um, signed. And in fact, the, the Peter family are, are somewhat more, um, are less aggressive perhaps, that might be a way of describing it. They're less aggressive than some of the other Catholic mm -hmm. families to be found in Essex. 
Mm. Um, but they themselves, of course, become targets uh, for um, Parliament in particular. Um, they have, the, like, like other Catholics, they have their estates seized and have to compound, compound for them. But, but, uh, but that's one of the key questions. Um, those, those petitions which I showed you, I might be able to pull one back for you. Um, let me just see if I can pull it back. Uh, I've highlighted at the bottom of this before the names, the final uh, statement made. And two things interest me about it. One is they, on the first line highlighted in red, you may not be able to read it very easy. It says yeah. that they you are- haven't, You haven't shared your screen, John. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let me go back and try and I can't yeah, share my screen. Thank you for telling me. <coughs> are we now shared? We are. OK. Right. Does that are you there now? Yes. Thank you. So you'll see that this first statement says um, they they that they are according to our late protestation. That is having taken this oath to defend the king, to defend the Protestant church, to defend parliament. They're now using it to justify uh, their petitioning. But the one that might chill you a little living in the 21st century is that they are saying that they, with their lives and their estates, and on this final line, line they're going to defend the king, the state, against the enemies of God. And, and that's a chilling phrase because that's essentially describing Catholics as enemies of God. And it might come to include those people who have been associated with uh, Charles I's um, church. So um, mm. it, it makes Catholicism in the county uh, and what happens around the petition, as you rightly say, very, very important. Thank you. The next question is from Anne Grimshaw. Uh, question from Anne Grimshaw. Are there petitions <coughs> like, like this for Lancashire? If so, are they in the Lanx Record Office in Preston? Would you like the good or the bad news? Uh, both. <laughs> okay, I well, the, 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 the good news is not only are there many petitions for Lancashire, uh, but they are some of the most detailed that I, that I um, sorry, let me start again. I'm so sorry. For Lancashire, there are, uh, f f if you're looking interested in lists of names, then f forget petitions for a moment. Some of the most detailed protestations I came across are to be found for Lancashire. And so good are they that a young American scholar in the University of Cambridge is actually writing a PhD about, about these listings. Uh, the Lancashire Family History Society has had a long-term project to transcribe and publish those names. Um, uh, uh, I have to say that when I was doing my research over some years, and writing my book, I kept hoping, but you know, I, I was disappointed. Um, so I don't quite know where that project is yet. So if you have an interest in Lancashire and you have an interest in Lancashire places, uh, then there are many petitions and most of those are to be found in the, in the parliamentary archive, which mm. is very good news for all of us under COVID restrictions. Because mm -hmm. as, I've, as, as I've said, if you go to the parliamentary archive, just Google parliamentary archives, mm -hmm. there is a very well organized website and you can look at the, the actual returns it, 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 and it, it digitally reproduced there. And if, 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 if everybody doesn't mind me jumping from my desk for a moment. Um, I'm a great uh, fan of family history societies. They do extraordinarily good work. Uh, and this book, which you may or may not be able to read, does it get, oh, no. 
does it get itself reversed or can you see no, it? No, it's fine, it's fine. This, 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 this is an extraordinary book produced by the Federation. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It's the very familiar name, Jeremy Gibson, who's done extraordinary books like this. And it lists for every county uh, the surviving protestation returns. It's, it's not quite up to date. I found more in my research. Uh, and it also lists some of the other listings. Uh, the, the protestation wasn't the only oath taken. Um, and and if, if you can't grab this and email me, I can at least uh, send send you send you the details. But but it but it was a bible to me, and as I say, I think an, an extraordinary example of what family history societies can produce. Um, as an aside, the, the finest edition of Protestation Returns uh, is for Lincolnshire uh, oh. by the Family History Society there. In just mm -hmm. you know, just amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Great. Good. Thank you. The next question is from Sue. Thank you for the Rayleigh information. Oh, sorry. Thank you. For um, next one was from Roger. Given its religious radicalism, does Braintree Par Parish appear? Um, the, the, the good news is it does. Um, so I've identified Braintree. Um, the bad news is that the contemporary hand says that 526 uh, signed, made a mark, and of those I've identified so far, I have uh, 156 in one part of the petition, and I have another 180 in another part of the petition, and I've clearly got still to find the rest. These very large Essex parishes, particularly like uh, Bocking and Braintree, clothing townships, generated very long lists. And whoever was doing this job loved them because they could cut them up and stick them and you know, produce very large uh, quantities of names. But as you rightly point out, that there are some parishes like Braintree where we know there is a strong association between the cloth industry and support for Puritan for Puritanism, where we can often identify the ministers. And it's not unsurprising, I think, that we should expect them to appear, unlike perhaps the Nevilles of Cressing Temple or the Peters of Ingate, of Ingate Stone. Um, and um, it, it, I mean, I have a sort of larger project behind this attempt to do what I'm doing at the moment. And it would be lovely to think that if we can arrive at a point <clears throat> where we do have parishes reconstituted, we might then think to, to, uh, to think about the names we find there in relationship to the history of those particular uh, parishes. And clearly Braintree uh, will be an extremely uh, important parish and, and a parish that has you know, really very good records in the Essex Record Office. So, so could do some interesting work there. Thank you. Next question from Jane Parmes, Parmenter. Have you been able to identify any signatures from the parishes of the Rodings or Easters? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question, because <laughs> they're my nightmare. So I have, for White Roding, 35 names. Uh, all, all written out in a uniform hand. The, the working assumption would be that that's the, work, that's the hand of the local minister, or if not of the local minister, perhaps somebody important. Very occasionally, not only do you get the minister's name at the top of the petition, but you get the names of the church wardens. So you can see the way in which the parish's administrative unit is operating to, to, secure, to secure the petition. And when I, when I identified, um, uh, identified that particular group, around them, I started to find other roadings. But I can't yet, you know, I can't yet conclusively show that 
I found all of them. So, so white I've got. Um, sadly, I can't give you the rest at the moment. Sometimes, infuriatingly, there was a little gap. And so whoever our, our happy scissor wielding individual or individuals were, they found a gap and they could then take a parish, snip, snip, snip a few names, stick it, stick it, stick it to, to fill the gap. So, you know, I mean, I try not to grind my teeth at those points, but. Mm. Thank you. The, the next question is, do you know if any of the Dutch inhabitants of the county signed these petitions or was it restricted to English people only? That's, that's a great question. And until this week, I couldn't have answered it. But in fact, for, for one of the Essex coastal parishes, there are a couple of names which are identified as being Dutch men. And so we must assume that they were somehow caught up in the trade. They may, they may have been set, settled, but I don't think they were. And that, that, that they found themselves right. invited to, invited right. to sign. Um, but, but, but that aside, I don't know. It will be interesting to go back to someone like Dedham. Uh, I haven't yet found Halstead. It would be very, very nice to find Halstead. That's, a very, that's going to be a long list. And to see whether, in fact, there are names there, uh, which are, again are, are of actually continental refugees who we know to have come and settled, or for that matter, Colchester. So, so a, a very partial answer, but yeah, a couple of names. <clears throat> Uh, Janet, you've got a yellow hand up. I, is that what did you want to ask a question? It says Janet's iPad with a yellow hand. I don't know if you were asking a question. I'm waving at Janet. Do you have a question? She's got to unmute. You have to unmute yourself, Janet. You'll have to unmute yourself. She's on her iPhone. No, you need, sorry, that was this camera. You take the camera off, you've still got me on mute. Can I ask a question while Janet's in it? Do you have an idea for roughly the number of signatures and what sort of percentage have you identified? Um, I, I should have been able to tell you that, um, but um, uh, my, my, my four-year-old granddaughter lives with me and this week she went back to her um, uh, to to her nursery, and as as you perhaps know, nurseries are great places for spreading disease. Uh, and all I'll say is, you're lucky to have me sitting in one piece, standing in front of you. So I I had an ambition to go through and count the contemporary hand identifiers of those numbers. <laughs> So I can, I can tell you that it's some thousands. I think the, for what it's worth, these are strange figures to, 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 to bandy around. Perhaps the population in mid 17th century Essex was give or take something like 100,000. You then got to start to work with the, demo, the, the figures demographers give us to uh, use a, a, a multiplier of 4.5, so you need to divide that, that population by 4.5 to get back to the number of households and therefore the potential number of uh, signatures. And then you have to do a further calculation, which is to take away those who are women and those who are children. And it is possible under the, you know, there's been extraordinarily good work done on the demography of early modern England by the Cambridge group for the, the study of population and it would be possible to arrive at a figure of some thousands some figure that was very very far away from the hundred thousand figure we started with and so I think that my kind of working assumption at the moment is and I'm sorry I haven't I didn't have time to at least count those 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 uh, estimates was that there is going to be some gap between the number of signatures, even if they're in their thousands, that the petitions hold, and the number of petitions, the number of signatures we might have expected to find. And that might be a couple of thousand, it might be a couple of thousand, give, 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 give or take 
uh, a thousand, and, and at the uh, present we simply, you know, not able to to uh, to answer your your, your question. Um, do, do you have a feeling from what percentage of the signatures you've actually gone through? Have you got to fifty percent, twenty percent? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is this is this is an obsession of mine. Uh, and it's an obsession which, if you are employed by a university, you're not allowed to pursue. Because in a university as a researcher, and I ended my life as a, as a research professor, uh, you are not only expected to do research, you're expected to raise money uh, for research. And, and in order to raise money for research, you have to publish. And in order for the university to be... Uh, um, rated for the distribution of funds by the government, uh, there's an additional reason for you to publish. So a project like this, which when I started it had no immediate outcome, uh, is not something of which uh, anybody currently working in a university would be advised to undertake. A university would be, um, well, perhaps we'll say no more of that. Um, so, so, I, so I, I have literally gone through every one of those names at uh, some point, but in terms of actively trying to identify those parishes for which I don't yet have, uh, don't yet have any, anything I can pull on to identify it, I, I would say that I've done something like 40% in seriously looking at them. If anybody out there wants, as I say, to do a fairly simple task of putting the ship money in, into, you know, in, into typeface, either online or otherwise, it, it would probably be a key to unlock this petition, because that's in the late 1630s, this position, petition is in 1642. You, you would expect to get very quickly hits uh, which were which were uh, to, 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 to identify it. Um, I mean I, I should say against myself and against what I said about universities I do think that I'm at a point where we can start to answer some really quite important questions about you know to go back to where I started which is quite extraordinary that ordinary men and women in Essex should be invited to sign petitions and to do so in their thousands. Thank you. Janet, your question. Well, thank you. I keep thinking of new ones now. To, I'll just finish, just start with uh, what John just said uh, about people in the, I've, I've got people in the ship money, but not in the petition, and I've got 50 of them. But um, yeah, does that make sense? But it, it may mean some of them might be, you know, there's only five years, is it, between them? Yeah. Uh, oh, no, more than that. But anyways, the others, some of them uh, might have died in the meantime, so it doesn't really prove anything. But well, it does, I think. I mean, I think it's a, a nightmare. Um, I, I think there's probably five years maximum between those two documents, perhaps five right. to six years. And as uh, any of you who've tried to do family history will know, or if not, you should know, that where we have surviving very rarely local censuses, usually uh, conducted by and written down by the local minister, that in an alarmingly short period of time, uh, many, many families uh, kind of fallen out from that particular parish. In, instead of thinking as this as being a, 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 a largely immobile system, immobilized society mm. in which people are born into a parish, work in a parish and die in a parish. We have to think of it as being a, a much more mobile society in which certainly there was neo-local mobility, particularly driven by at marriage, but particularly becoming a servant, the experience for many men and women to do in this period. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't upstairs, downstairs service. It was the fundamental backbone of a labor force. So apprenticeship or service would move people. 
And then for, for, for those of us who live in Essex, we have to think about a topological map in which London is always next door. So that large number of young women in particular would have been sucked into the service sector. It, 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 so I'm not surprised, Janet, that there is an everyday movement of people between dates. And you discourage me slightly because I still think that, that comparing ship money and uh, the petition yeah. would be a major advance. And why that's frustrating is we have to think about the fact that people could refuse to sign this. Oh. And that therefore, if some names are missing, as I, if we go back to that example I was using of the protestation versus, versus the, the petition for the other Essex village, if some names are missing, did that mean not that the people were missing, but that as the documents become increasingly less conventional, but as they become more clearly seen to be taking partisan political positions, did people decide not to sign? You'd have to be very brave, going back to what Graham Hart said, assembling in a church. You'd have to be brave to stand out from your neighbours. These are being, they are being represented. One of the things that these petitions are doing is not trying to represent public opinion. They're trying to actually constitute public opinion. This is the text. This is what matters. You sign your name. Yes, because that's another thing I was going to ask was the people hadn't signed. What would be their reason? Was, um, well, it, it, lots of different reasons. If, if you went to the coast, lo lots of people are away fishing. Uh -huh. um, when the protestation returns are signed for the country as a whole, and they're signed for, <coughs> signed for fishing communities. Very often, people are described as being away. If we're down in Dorset, they're actually en route to Newfoundland. So that's a long absence, but there might be other absences to be found. In the summer, there are people who are, you know, don't have property and who are harvesters and who are moving around. There's a sort of uh, recognised... Mm -hmm. And so people are described as not be living in the parish, but not being there because they're away for purposes of work. Um, right. But do they, put, do they put their names down? But they don't by and large. I mean, it, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Where, where we have a uniform hand, you have to be um, quizzical as a historian to say, did everybody who were present in church and did they all raise their hand when he said, do we all agree we want to protect the king against this terrible threat from Catholics? Mm -hmm. Of course. Or, 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 you know, did he just say, well, the, these people live in the parish. Um, there are lovely things to be found in these names. So one minister actually alphabet, alphabetizes his parish and puts all the families together. Oh. So, so, you know, was he just doing it because they'd all been present? He knew they'd been present and, and they, 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 they signed. Um, you know, we have to be, we have to be careful uh, not to assume that a name appearing on a petition at a particular moment. Uh, and, and all these petitions, including the royalist ones, say very, very similar things. If you're a historian of the period, you can work out what they're really saying but I guess if you were living through this, this extraordinary time and you heard the word king, you perhaps thought, well, I'm being a good subject of the king by signing my name. Um, one of the things that makes it more possible to see signatures as being important or names as being important is that cheap print because there is a, increasingly a running commentary available to people through cheap print, which is telling them, don't sign that, it's against the king, or, you know, don't sign that, it's against parliament. So there is a kind of running commentary, which is kind of expanding the knowledge available to people. <clears throat> Forgive me, John, 
uh, I've got my own burning question about literacy, but yeah. I think I can email. Uh, I, I think you have worked so hard for us and you either want to get back to your work or recover. <laughs> uh, I, can I call upon Shirley Durgan, please? Hi, John. Great Hi, to be in, in Essex branch again and see you yeah. again. Um, I think the, the, the interest generated in the Q&A session just illustrated what a, what a great talk that was. Thank you very much on behalf of everyone. Well, thank everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I just remind people, if you missed any of the talk or know anybody else who'd like to see the talk, a recording of the talk will be available from early next week on our, uh, from our website or from our Twitter feed or from our Facebook page. Thank and you. before you all go, you don't have to retire right away. You can hang around. Some of our committee members will discuss with you anything that's come up. But I want to point out 10th of April 2021, which is our next meeting. Same time, same place, your rooms. Uh, when we'll have a talk on Lady Jane Grey by Dr. Nicola Tallis. Thank you all, one and all. Loved it. The same Zoom address as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, right. Cheers, John. Excellent. Yep. I, I shall, I shall, next time I shall look forward to the blues harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, John. It's nice to see you. Yes. I, 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 I have some thoughts uh, talking to you, Janet, about perhaps jointly publishing that uh, Will You very kindly once uh, uh, gave me a lady. Uh, was it Jane? Ben ben oh, Bernardiston. Yeah. Yeah. Funny, I was just seeing, looking at that today for the first time for ages. She, she was quite a one, wasn't she? I, I've, I've now actually got gone and got the original from the National Archive, and I'm. Oh, good. Would you Would you be interested in doing a joint piece? Don't Don't want to commit you. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I can do much new, but I've, I've got what I wrote before. Yeah. Could you put we, your we, name? Could, could you put your name on something? Mm -hmm. There's a joke. Can you put your name on an article if 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 we write it? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It'd be a good thing. <laughs> Excellent. It would be. I'll be in uh, touch then. Be great. I look forward to it. Okay. I'm afraid Bye. I seem to have moved on a bit. Yeah. <laughs> From your century. <laughs> <laughs> Surely anyway, not. Anyway, lo lovely to see you, John. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Sorry we couldn't take you to lunch, John. Yeah. Don't worry. I, I, I'm pleased to be here. I, when I agreed 18 months ago, little did I know that, you know, I wouldn't be inside a record office or a library for the, for the last, you know, 12 months. I, you I will take a token of our appreciation, though, please? Um, I'm happy. I'm happy just to have had people on a Saturday afternoon who share my enthusiasm. That, that, that's absolutely fine. We're sending a donation to VCH, I think. That, that, would, be, that would be even better. That would be great. Well done, Andy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ian, did you see my note to you? Oh, I just said, you know, um, Ruth, um, who was asking about references and things for schools i understand you're doing a tour can't you ian uh not in essex no in exeter <laughs> but <laughs> only virtually <laughs> but uh, anyway i only sent it to you privately so it, okay. it doesn't matter <laughs> ian could i apologize for late arrival problems with internet stability today oh tell me about them i'm gonna have to change my machine i'm only <laughs> here by the skin of my wife mm. or whatever i only remembered at 231 oh shame <laughs> on you <laughs> i was number I'm 80 okay. i was number 83 <laughs> okay see you again paul yeah see you paul mm. bye bye bye, bye. bye. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Andy, for get, getting in really late because I was number 83 out of 91. <laughs> was that our total, Andy? That's 91. That's excellent. That's 100 or so because there's 
quite a few of these two people that can make that. Uh, yeah. yeah. That is brilliant. I took out the extra cover in case there's more people, but I don't know whether to do that next month or not. I'll have to think about it. Martin, can I thank you for getting John? He was good, wasn't he? Very good. He is Excellent. very good. That's what our HA talk should be about. We're on the frontiers of what people know. <laughs> I mean, and don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, in our case, yes, don't know. <laughs> yeah. John, I like the treatment of the teacher. Did you know the teacher who was asking? I don't, I, I'm not quite sure where, where she was from. So uh, I might try and inquire next time she's, she's in the meeting. She, I, I don't know her. But that Is was it somebody that's, called Ruth, wasn't it? But that's music to hear those things <laughs> dealt with. Because yeah. mm. I, I was suggesting to Ian that she could listen to his talk as well. No, no. His Exeter talk <laughs> about... Yeah, Ruth, Ruth Hearn, H-E-A-R-N. I'm going to go and get a cup of tea now. So yeah. bye, everyone. Nice Thank to see you. Very yeah, nice I'm, going, I'm going to make a coffee now as well. So. Well, for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Send it through. <laughs> Give a to bring, take it round to us. <laughs> I'll have a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> it ought to be a bob on us with the historical association. Oh. Or a Garibaldi. Well, yeah. indeed. There must be a third one somewhere. Yeah, digestive, but I'm not quite sure who that no. relates to. No, no, I'm, I'm struggling on that one. That's more, that's more of a public health one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think politically Garibaldi is probably more acceptable than Bourbon, isn't it, really? Yes. It depends on your political stance, I suppose. Well, yeah. <laughs> don't, sta be... don't start us all off. <laughs> right, Ian, I've got to I've got to go now, but it's nice to see you again. And you He's gone. And thank you right. for uh, the questions. You're welcome. Sorry they've got long a bit long. Hey. Oh, they were interesting. Yeah. I think he had new ones well, as he went as he went along, you know. Mm. But I don't know whether I did my question right because it I think it went to Shirley or something. I'll discuss that another time, though. Just anyway, good to see everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody. for your company. See you Bye. soon. Bye. 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 Hi, John. John Hannibal. Good to see you. John, you're muted. Excellent, you can be with us. But you enjoyed that too. We'd love to hear from you, John, but you're still mute, muted. Can you press the button at the bottom of your screen, please? <clears throat> Never mind. Good to see you anyway. Wendy? You there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. How are you? <laughs> How are you? I'm okay. I'm in the middle of some drastic dental work, so that's why I'm covered up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I should be okay by eight. Hope it's not too painful. No, it's not. No, it isn't painful. Uh, anyway, I'll see you in April. Yeah, see you, Wendy. Yeah, yeah, bye. Well, Andy and Jenny, thanks to Jenny as well, Andy. Yeah, indeed. Brilliant job. Crack. Very good. Crack. The well, next well, meeting, the next meeting will be just before the hairdressers open, won't it? So that'll <laughs> be interesting. That should Im that won't improve anything then. <laughs> Okay, well, goodbye to everybody. Have a yeah, time to yeah, switch thank it you. all off. Thank you very much yeah. for that, Andy. It's really good. Bye. Bye. Bye.